When I was 14 years old, I didn't have a computer at home, so no way I had internet either. At the time, everyone I knew went to cybers, places with a bunch of PCs where you would pay by the hour to use their computers. In this shop, some computers were even outside. The owner would put them out to get more customers because his rented space was small, but I normally played inside. I think they're known as cyber cafes in other countries. Back then, I remember everyone played a game called Counter-Strike, and I started doing it too. As the only girl, I obviously attracted a lot of attention, especially because I actually got pretty good at the game. I played alone at first, got laughed at a lot too. Che, las pibas can't play this game, I heard often. But after some time, everyone wanted me on their team. The cyber I frequented was almost directly behind my house in an Argentine city that's now famous for being the hometown of the best soccer player in the world. The cafe sat right in the corner, and the cyber was a little up the street. It was a hole in the wall, if I'm being honest, a place for pibes, really. Only a few adults would show up to print documents and other stuff, and that's how we started. This guy started showing up. I didn't notice him at first because all I wanted was to play with the pibes. The boys, my age, I mean. I had become one of them in a sense, although they still goaded me. But it was playful, though, just fun between friends of a similar age. But one day, I had to leave earlier because my parents were having a special dinner with my sister, Fiorella, who was about to graduate school. She had great grades. I stepped out of the shop, and this guy had just wrapped up whatever he was doing on one of the computers outside. At first, I thought it was just a coincidence, but... Then I noted that he stood up at the same time that I stepped out. I said goodbye to the owner, who was enjoying a smoke, and started walking home. I felt him beside me, and he started talking immediately. He asked for my name. I just replied because I didn't suspect him of anything. He told me his. It was Alejo. He asked about my age and how I got good at playing that game for boys, and I just rolled my eyes. But I just said that I come here often, started playing, and got pretty good. I had rounded the corner cafe and was close to my house. Now he probably knew where I lived already, it wasn't exactly a secret. I walked to the cyber and everywhere else, but I still didn't want him to follow me too closely. I told him that it was nice to meet him, but I had an important dinner with my cousin and his football buddies at my house, and I told him bye, really emphasizing the word and waving. He took the hint, and I sighed and walked faster to my house. That was only the first hurdle, though. The next afternoon, he was right outside in the same spot that I had left him the evening before, just waiting for me. I got a little spooked then, but okay, this could have been a coincidence too, right? Well, I just continued walking. But he started to talk to me again. He told me about himself, saying that he was 22. He had studied to be an electrician and had a job. He said that he could buy me gifts and take me to the cinema. I wasn't interested. I told him that straight up. I said that I'm 14. A 22-year-old should do that with someone their own age, and he said no. He said he didn't like the girls his age because they were shallow and only cared about money. He had seen me at the cyber, playing and laughing with the guys. I was so mature in his eyes, and the prettiest girl in town, he said. Whatever. I didn't want anything from him, and I repeated that and arrived at the cyber. I'm glad he didn't follow inside or bother me anymore, but he stayed outside while I played. About an hour after I arrived, I was killed in the game and I peeked outside for a quick second, and he was gone, so I just called it quits early and went home. I didn't like that. Playing Counter-Strike was my favorite thing to do that summer. Even the boys were disappointed I left, but I didn't want to say anything to them. The guy made me uncomfortable, but he hadn't really done anything. The next day, I went a little earlier than usual. He wasn't nearby and I remembered smiling like, yes, thank God he got the message, and hoped that he would just leave me alone. I went and played with the strangers online until the rest of the boys got there. But then he arrived, and this time, he went in and sat on the computer next to mine. He clicked on stuff, but I wasn't paying attention. Fortunately, we were loud and used headphones during our playtime, so I could just pretend that I didn't hear him. He asked me why I left earlier the previous day, and I didn't answer. He asked why I hadn't waited for him to walk me. 
He started saying that streets were pretty dangerous for girls like me to be around alone. Yes, I know this. They're unsafe because of people like you. I wanted to yell that, and I remember clicking the mouse a little too roughly, picturing killing him in the game. He continued talking even when I wouldn't answer, and he started making me promises, like I would never have to work if I was with him, that I would get presents because he had a job, and I noted that he was speaking so low that the rest of the boys couldn't hear him, and my skin was crawling, but I was pretending not to hear anything. After a long while, he got up, went outside, and talked to the owner. Finally, I couldn't hear him, so I had left earlier the previous day because he was gone for a second, but this time, he was still there, and so I stayed. I wanted to leave at my usual hour, but he was still there, and I waited, just keeping on playing. The boys were finally done, and I left with them. He didn't follow. I was talking to one of the boys, Santi, the entire time. They walked by my house, I said goodbye and went in. Then I got scolded by my mom for being out way later than I'd said I would and hanging out with the boys, and I just took it from her because I knew that that was going to happen. But Fiorella noticed something. I normally cried when I got scolded. I didn't this time because I knew that I did the right thing to wait and come home later with the other boys. She came in my room while my mom was still angrily washing the dishes and asked me why I stayed late. She asked me what happened. Was I dating one of those boys? I finally told someone about the guy. I made it clear that I didn't want anything to do with him and she got almost angrier than my mom. But my sister was a different kind of angry. She always turned more serious. She's mostly goofy, a laid back person, but when she got angry, she was cold as ice. She told me that I needed to tell more adults and sooner. She was proud of me for not letting that guy convince me with the gifts or whatever he was offering, but I needed to make sure that I kept away from him as much as possible. Even a simple smile could make things worse. Then, she told me a story about her friend, Augustina, who started receiving a ton of compliments from her teacher. She was 12 at the time, her teacher was 25, and he would compliment her often. Unlike me, who was not interested in dating an older man like that, Augustina was flattered by this attention. She always got the best grades for doing barely anything. One smile was all it took for her teacher to give less homework or do things for her. Theo said that Augustina's big mistake was that she thought that she was in control of this male counterpart. She was not. He gave her favors, yes, and soon enough, gifts were brought into the equation, and he bought her everything Augustina wanted. Remember those old Nokia phones? They were like a brick and crazy heavy, but back then, they were new and fancy. The teacher got Augustina one of those. Phil rolled her eyes and said that Augustina acted like a queen then. Not everyone had those phones, not kids anyway, and Augustina was my sister's friend, so this happened almost six years before my stalker issues. He texted her often, sweet messages at first, and you can probably guess how that played out. The messages got more explicit, no camera phones existed then, luckily, and soon, the text messages turned different. The teacher wanted Augustina to come to a party and bring one of her friends for a double date. Theo said that Augustina invited her, but Theo had had the same little boyfriend since she was like five. No way. So Augustina asked someone else. They went to the party, and Theo didn't know what happened, but... Augustina and the other friend never spoke again. She kept seeing the teacher though. Their parents found out soon enough and the entire school did too. And that teacher was fired and Augustina acted like she was being torn from her Romeo. Last year, Augustina got pregnant, dropped out of school and ran away from home. Theo said that they didn't know much about her because she's with her former teacher. And Augustina isn't allowed to really have friends. And that's how she explained to me the concept of grooming, which we didn't really have a word for and I only learned the popular name for it from the internet in the last few years, but I understood the essence of it. Theo said that men who go for little girls want one thing aside from you know what, and that's control. So she told me that I had to either stop going to that cyber or start telling others about what was going on. I said it wasn't fair that I had to give up something that I loved because some creep decided to target me, and Theo said that I was right, 
so she started walking with me and picking me up on some days. She saw him that first day, and he seemed to squirrel away. And that night, I thought that I saw him out of the corner of my eye while walking back, but I wasn't sure, as Fio was still with me. But she couldn't be by my side always. Neither of us wanted to tell our parents because they would limit both of us from going out. So, Fio convinced Mom that it was better for me to walk home with my friends than to do it alone. And Mom saw a reason for once. And that's how I got closer to my Counter-Strike buddies, particularly Santi. I walked home with him and another boy, Beto, most nights. Santi was my age and Beto was 13. The creep only appeared once, but I think he noticed that my sister wasn't around anymore. He was waiting for the boys to stop taking me home. Sucks for him because Sante became my very first boyfriend. Beto was his best friend and we all became inseparable. We had spent the beginning of that summer only playing that game, but we suddenly wanted to do more. We went to the movies and bowling. Beto's brother was a skater. He wanted to go pro, so we went to a few of his competitions. And the summer passed without another appearance from that cyber creep. We still played games, but it had gone from an everyday thing to maybe twice a week. He must have forgotten about me or just couldn't track me, I guess. School started again, and my mom told me to sign up for a sport, so I just picked volleyball. It was fun. We had our coach, Andreas, who was tough, but we all had to get better before the inter-school competitions began, and that's when he appeared again. I don't know how, but he was right outside my school when we finished practice one day. Volleyball was an extracurricular activity right at the same institution. I got angry and new people were still around me, so I finally went up to him and told him, right there, to stop. I said, this isn't funny. I don't want to date you. Find a girl your own age and leave me alone. If you follow me again, I will tell my parents and go to the police. He laughed and said that he hadn't done anything to me. I called him a creep and said that only losers would go after younger girls. He got angry and almost grabbed my arm, but I was quicker. He started laughing again, but it was a very strange sound. It honestly didn't sound normal. He said I was acting like a brat now that I had a boyfriend. I laughed back, but I was just pretending to be brave. I said, yeah, I got a boyfriend, and if Santi finds out about you, he's going to be angry. I was done talking to him and walked away to catch my bondi. And I remember his words as I got on. Your boyfriend won't be there long, but I will. I won't stop, and I always get what I want. I couldn't take that anymore. Others heard him, and he was still not ashamed or anything. I thought he was afraid of being seen, but it looked like he wasn't at all. Then why back off the other times? Did he get bolder? Why now? I still didn't know what to do, but I didn't tell my mom or Theo, and I tried to forget it because, in a way, he was right. No one was going to do anything because the guy was just there. He technically didn't touch me because I pulled away and he hadn't harmed me either. I didn't think repeating his words would carry enough weight for the police to even listen. And he was right about another thing. Santi wasn't there long. I went to his school to surprise him on a day that I didn't have volleyball practice, but he was holding hands with another girl. I remember making a scene. I mean, I was 14 and his girlfriend just laughed at me and others joined her. So I just walked back alone. I had to calm down before getting home, so I sat in a park. Well, it wasn't exactly a park, but it was like a little plaza a few blocks away from my house with some benches and trees. After about 20 minutes, I swear I got a spidey sense because I saw him coming from like a mile away. I just reacted and ran off. I heard him calling my name, too and I cursed myself for telling him my name at the beginning of the summer. But I kept running and slowed down only after reaching the cafe on the corner. He was gone or had fallen back or hidden away. I went home and all thoughts of Santi disappeared. I had bigger issues than a stupid 14-year-old boy. The next day I went to volleyball and he was outside. I just knew that this time wasn't going to be as easy to get rid of him as last time and that I couldn't just outrun him home. I was too far and needed to use the bondi, which wouldn't arrive for a while. I turned back and my volleyball friends saw me pacing around the school's fence. What's going on, they asked, and I just told them. 
That man has been stalking me. He's been doing it for months. I told him I didn't want anything with him, but he just kept appearing, and I think he's only going to get worse. They said that we'll go home with you. I really didn't want to. I wanted to be brave and not put anyone else at danger. We were all little girls, but I just said yes. We started walking, and once we were away from the school, he made his move. Hey, I'll take her home, he said, as if though he had any authority. One of the girls screamed, No, are you crazy? Get out of here. The others said somewhat the same, and he actually pushed one of them. I yelled, and there was a scuffle with those two girls trying to pull him off of me. Stop, 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 I kept screaming. One of the girls fell on her butt, and it sounded pretty painful. He pushed the other away and grabbed my hair. I remember seeing his eyes as he spat in my face with the worst breath I'd ever smelled. He said, You've tried my patience enough, and you're coming with me now. He grabbed my arm in a vice that almost twisted my skin and pulled. I was using all my weight to stay back, but my shoes couldn't find any traction on the smooth cement. But a volleyball suddenly hit his head, and I saw how it tilted and heard the echo of the contact. He let go, grabbing one side of his head to rub the pain while I scrambled away. It was Andreas, the coach. He shouted at him, asking him if he's nuts, touching little girls, saying that he already called the police screaming for him to go away, go, go. When the creep wouldn't move, Andreas used the other volleyball that he was carrying and threw it at him, and this time, it went right for his nose. The creep screamed, and I saw blood coming out of his nose. All the girls were now behind the coach, Andreas. He begins to shout, You want another? Get out of here! I don't ever want to see you come back. And finally, that creep ran off. I then went on to tell him everything that happened, and it turns out that he hadn't actually called the cops, but then he did. Other staff at the school got involved because they were worried about other girls. They got his picture from the CCTV, and I finally had to tell my parents, and they were so angry, but Theo calmed them down. People in the neighborhood were told about him, and the cyber owner knew his full name. Now, I won't say it here, but once the cops had his name... It was over. He must have fled the area because he didn't come back and they didn't catch him from what we heard. But Theo and her boyfriend agreed to take me to and from school when I needed to for the rest of the year. My mom did it when they couldn't and I got closer to my volleyball friends so the moms decided to start a carpool. But luckily I never saw that creep again and I wasn't physically harmed, just a little shaken from being accosted by the stalker. My friend did have a huge butt bruise, and we laughed about that later, and so the moral of the story is that you need to tell adults, at least the ones that are close to you. That's what I've learned. I would have hated if it was my daughter that kept it from me, and my kids are young, but I will buy them simple phones when they're a little older, just so they can always call for help. And don't stay quiet, because more often than not, these things do escalate. They don't stop until they are stopped. Also, I would ask if you're in a position to help a friend or a student, do it. Because my volleyball mates, who were really friends at that time, stalled him long enough for Coach Andreas to show up, and I will forever, ever be grateful to him for that. I'm a freelance photographer. No one fancy, and my name really isn't known, but I rather enjoy it. My work is usually on location, taking shots of a particular spot or area, and this happened during an assignment in Bristol, and if it matters, I'm a man. I'm based in central London, and it was meant to be a quick run to Bristol and back. I headed down to Paddington Station, as one does, and took the train service, it's almost two hours to Bristol, which is perfect for a little nap unless you want to take in the sights. I didn't that day, and I arrived at Bristol Temple Meads and set up my job. I must say that this gig should have alerted me to something wrong from the very start, though. I was just supposed to take as many photographs of the historic city as possible. Usually, I would get something a bit more specific, but when I tried to request more details, 
The client said that I could use my own taste to decide the best photos. I offered my packages, and they purchased one of the priciest ones. Therefore, I set off from Temple Meads to the streets. Honestly, it was one of the best assignments I had ever been given, and I was chuffed with every bit of it, even snapping a brutalist gem near Bristol when it was a near delight. I kept walking, trying to decide if I should go to the common photo-worthy spots, but any client could probably purchase those photographs on stock image pages, so I went a little deeper, in the corners and alleys, not worrying about getting lost. I clocked the old, the fresh, and the rough bits of what the city had to offer. And hours later, I returned to the station to grab my train home, looking forward to the whole editing process. It's just, I had a little issue. A bloke I had clocked during the day in Bristol had photobombed several of my shots. It didn't look evident, but I hadn't stayed in one place. I'd been to too many different spots, and I walked for hours and even took a cab to the furthest spot. And whoever it was, was seemingly following me. It was a shame because those photographs were really some of the best. Obviously, other people appeared. I was taking shots on a random day, but this person looked straight at the camera. And for some reason, I just couldn't remember him, as if he was only appearing thanks to my lens. And that was honestly bonkers, of course. Regardless, I put those photos of him aside, choosing the ones where the few pedestrians were just going about their day. I knocked them into shape and pinged them over to the client. I didn't hear from this person in several days, so I went about my other jobs, which were mostly in London. So I was on the underground or the occasional black cab if it had been a knackered day. Around a week after I had delivered the Bristol images, the client wrote back, but his request was very bizarre. They wanted to know if those were all the pictures that I had taken. I was puzzled because I had delivered the package they'd purchased with the right amount of photographs. Still, I wrote back saying if there had been some sort of error. And the answer was no. They just wanted to know if they could have the rejects. I wouldn't normally do that. For one, my name is associated with these photos, so no photographer would want a technically bad shot making the rounds online whether it's for a publication or someone's social media. Many would never even show their clients unedited photos. Usually, I would bin the ones that I didn't find worthy enough to edit. But I had kept some of this, particularly because of the stranger in some of them. I explained all to the client and they insisted. I told them that I would need to be paid extra for their photos as they would be outside the agreed package and I would have to edit them. They accepted immediately and paid almost as soon as I sent the invoice, so I got to work and deliver them. Strangely, I didn't feel right about it. I told myself that that was the last time I was doing that sort of thing. The money was good, but you need to have some boundaries and rules as a professional. The coming week passed and I worked on a wedding, not my cup of tea, but it was a favor for a friend. I edited some shots and you may have guessed that this stranger was in a few. But for the life of me, I just couldn't place his face at that event. And also, it wasn't in Bristol. He had that same stare, straight into the lens like he wanted to look into my soul. And it just gave me the heebie-jeebies and I promptly sent it into the bin. I wasn't about to bother sending my friends these shots. I finished editing the wedding sets when an email from the Bristol gig client popped in. They wanted more shots from different angles and more particular places in the city. I prepared the details and this time I upped the price because I would have to use cabs to get to some areas and the entire payment came in quickly. And so off I went, Paddington to Temple Meads and to all the places in Bristol. And after a couple of hours, it was clear that it would be much better to stay the night at a hostel nearby than go back to London and return tomorrow. I had planned for that in my pricing, so I looked for a good spot. There was a pub a few paces away, which was perfect as I had a few pints, talked to the barman about obscure places that could produce some good shots and walked to the hostel later. It wasn't late at all, though. People were still milling about, but I felt like I had a shadow on my tail. It was a feeling that had never happened before in all my years. I looked back and no one in particular seemed to be focused on me, but I quickened my pace. I swear it was rather like having a laser pointing at me. 
I could almost feel the heat on the back of my left shoulder. It was so strange. I got to the hostel, turned back again at the door, and nothing. But I felt it again as I stepped inside. I can't explain it more. As I lay in the questionable bed that night, I considered the plight of women. Most of my female mates have had experiences like that, and they've told me, but I could only ever sympathize and really not empathize because I hadn't felt this odd anxiety before. The next day, I was determined to knock this out and go home, and I remember leaving my bag on a bench while I photographed Bristol Harborside. That was my last planned shot before popping back to the station. It's the only moment that I left the bag alone, so the envelope I discovered on the train ride back to London could only have been placed at that moment. There were Polaroid pictures of me inside, not just in Bristol, but at my other assignments. The wedding, at St. James Park, at the underground, and walking into my flat building's front door. I was more fearful then. At this point, I realized I had a stalker, for sure. And I didn't know how bad it would become, but I breathed, closed my eyes on the train service, and endured the panic for a while. Almost sprinting from the station to my flat, I arrived and threw myself on the bed. I was sweating and horrified, unable to make sense of things. What did this guy want? I took the photos from my bag and went through them quickly, understanding that the earliest ones were from my first trip to Bristol, meaning that's when things started. Immediately, I blamed the client. I had already been put off by the request for extra shots and the ease with which they'd handed out money for what they'd wanted. Realistically, most people would haggle. I pulled up the email app on my phone and quickly wrote, What do you want? If the client was confused, I could just say, Oops, wrong recipient. My bad. But I had a feeling that they wanted me to do that. I got a notification almost right away. Ah, you knew it was me. How touching. I screamed in my pillow because they didn't answer the question, and I wrote again, Tell me what you want. I can give back all the money you paid before in exchange for you to stop following me. Please. I didn't want to. I had already spent a lot, but I'd hoped money would just get him off my case, and he wrote back, I don't want the money. I'll keep seeing you. I'll keep appearing in your shots. Our thing is just beginning. No more emailing. I blocked him and went to bed. The problem was is that he obviously had my address and began to email me from other accounts. I kept blocking and he kept going. Until one message. It doesn't matter if you ignore me. I will see you. I'll hire you again. We'll be in each other's photographs for as long as I'd want. It was disgusting. And what makes things worse is that I would start worrying about taking on any new clients. Any gigs to Bristol were off the question then. I assumed that he lived there since that's where this started, but I had seen him in the wedding photos. I would have to limit a few things and cut back on some work, but most of all, I had to pay attention. I checked my statements. I could survive a couple of months without much work except for clients I already trusted. I made the unfortunate decision to shut down my website. My socials went on hiatus, but he knew where I lived. Therefore, I called on my mate up in Scotland and stayed there for a few weeks. I didn't get any new emails. I took pictures just for fun and felt like I could finally breathe again. I went back home and got nothing for some time. I didn't know what that meant, but I hoped that maybe he'd given up. But sadly, that was not the case. He wrote again and was happy that I had returned. He said he missed me, and I just didn't get it. Was he mental, or dangerous, or both? I went through my past photos, gathering all those where he appeared. They weren't helpful, and that's why I couldn't place him at those jobs, and the authorities wouldn't be able to recognize him. I don't know if I had gone bonkers or if I had wanted to die, but I wrote back, Let's meet at Paddington tomorrow. I want to see you. And his response was enthusiastic. He asked if we could take photos together and what we would do. And I played his game. I told him we could go somewhere nice. I asked if he lived in Bristol and where, but he cleverly ignored that question and told me that he wanted to see St. James Park together. I said that was brilliant. I loved it there, but it was better if I greeted him at Paddington. 
See you tomorrow, I finished and waited. I couldn't sleep, trying to decide what I was going to do with this mental case. I wanted to call someone, but would he get spooked if I was accompanied? I didn't know if the authorities would take me seriously, and I fell asleep thinking about all my options and how I needed to end this once and for all. I was at Paddington at least half an hour before our agreed time. I was taking photographs of the train services and the people, not being overtly formal or anything. I tried to act like some kind of Taurus. I got a few selfies on my phone from different angles. His whole thing was to appear in my shots, so I kept checking the photos as I took them, which I don't normally do to see if anything was amiss. I didn't see him until one selfie. He was far. And I turned it all over, looked around, took more photos, took more selfies. He wasn't in them. I didn't want to call him out. The station was heaving and I walked around. I almost wanted to put my photo on that rapid shot setting to see if I could capture something, but I thought that that would look too mad. My hope was to get something that I could give to the police along with the emails. They may not help, but I had to do something. He wasn't anywhere, though. I finally stopped walking near one of the railways, looking through my phone for any new appearance. And then I felt it. That laser was on my back, but it was odder. It was closer. I knew it on some strange survival instinct. Therefore, I stood still, not moving an inch. I still felt it. I don't know what he was waiting for. Perhaps standing still was even more bonkers than arranging this meeting, but I had one goal and one chance, maybe. Finally, I don't know if I heard a rustle of leather or if I got a whiff of cologne, but I did a fast swivel and started snapping photos. I reckon he wasn't expecting that. He covered his face after two shots, I believe, and started running off. And I screamed, where are you going? And I was hoping that you'd appear in my photographs. Other people started watching us. I must have looked like the stalker then. I was running after them, and he wouldn't stop. Weren't we supposed to take photos together, I asked? I did notice that he had a Polaroid-type camera hanging around his neck, but it was one of those new ones, not the vintage, original-looking ones. I finally let go as we exited Paddington, and I grabbed my phone to check and saw his face clear as day in two images, and I thought that was enough, and so I went to the police to file a complaint. Sadly, as expected, there wasn't much I could do, but I felt better about it and went home. I waited for an email or something. I even checked myself in my bag in case this guy had sneaked something inside, and there was nothing. And a while passed, and I put my website back up and slowly took up clients. I made a policy to request contact information with full names for new people. And... Nothing odd has happened since. I did move out to a new flat a few months later, but for other reasons, no one else photobombed my photographs or acted like a ghost to get some attention. But that bloke remains in my thoughts as I still don't get why I was targeted. I wonder if he was another photographer or an old acquaintance with a fixation. I would not have thought of any of this being possible, but I just discovered something through a photo on a random post from an account I don't even follow where two people in the background have me questioning everything about what went down almost a decade ago. But I can't tell you what happened unless we go back to when I thought everything was perfect in my life. Let's start by picking fake names here, as I usually will have to do to remain anonymous. Now I'll call my family the Johnsons, that's generic enough, and I'll call my husband George and my daughter Lucy, and you can think of me as Linda. After years of living in a two-bedroom apartment, we bought a little house only 15 minutes outside the city, but we kept our city jobs, choosing to commute. Suddenly, we were the perfect American family. We had a yard, and perhaps my daughter could finally get that big dog she has always asked for, and the commute wasn't great, but... It was amazing to sleep in that house for the first time and not hear anything except for an owl hooting or something. The day after our move, we were even greeted by the neighbors. They were friendly. One brought a pie, 
I cringed a little, only after they left, but only because I had seen too many horror movies and true crime docuseries. Something just felt kind of suspicious about it all. It was too perfect, you know? So the first thing I did after we settled into a new routine was get my daughter that big dog. It was a rescue and became part of our family pretty quickly. He barely ever barked and was happy at home. I've always felt animals can sense things that we don't, so I trusted everything was fine after a few weeks of this sort of perfection. I even had a little barbecue party to invite the neighbors over, and that dog was fine with all of them, and we'll call him Rover. So I let the panic and paranoia go, and we got used to living in this area. I made friends with some people and discovered many had kids my daughter's age, and although I was a working mom, I got involved in some school activities. I didn't have time to become a room mother or anything like that, but I was much more present. One weekend, my mother-in-law came to visit. We'll call her Sheila. She's nice enough, not too judgy, and my husband loved her, but she lived on the other side of the country. She hated the city, but once she saw our new house, she made a promise to visit more often. Money was never really an issue for her. We lived modestly because my husband insisted on being independent, but his widowed mom was pretty loaded. During another weekend with Sheila, I was in the kitchen making all of us sandwiches for lunch when she pulled my arm roughly to the front side of the window. She asked who that was and pointed to the neighbor's house that sat on the other side of the street. I said that was our neighbor, David. I estimated David was around 20 years older than my husband and I. My mother-in-law went a little quiet and I asked what was wrong. She said David was watching our house a little too closely. I laughed a little because, no way. David wasn't the most social guy, but he really didn't give off any weird vibes either. And Rover liked him too. I told her that, and Sheila rolled her eyes, saying I can't always trust the dog's reaction. Well, I knew that. I wasn't stupid, but I didn't get any bad feelings, so I just patted her shoulder and went back to the sandwiches. We went for a walk through the neighborhood a few hours later partly to walk Rover and partly so Sheila could see other houses and the place in general. She said it was almost exactly like her neighborhood and was pleased that Lucy could finally get the childhood experience that she really needed. And I was happy at that moment. You don't often get that lucky with in-laws. Lucy walked a little further away from Rover and suddenly, Sheila grabbed my arm. She told me someone was following us. I looked around and saw David walking on the other side of the street. I told her he was just going on a stroll like the rest of us. Other neighbors were walking their pets too, and it was almost sort of a Norman Rockwell image if you've seen those. But my mother-in-law was shaking her head. She said no. That's what she thought too, but he had been walking next to us since we went out. I told her fine, let's just go back home, and she nodded holding my arm closer and pushing me to catch up with Lucy and Rover. When we were just a few paces near the house, she said, See? He's walking back now that we're walking back. I looked at David, who was just staring intently at the concrete, and considered it. We had been in the neighborhood a while now and I hadn't noticed anything, and I was the queen of paranoia at first. I told Sheila that I would keep an eye out too and thank you for informing me. I think she was glad that I took it pretty seriously at that moment, and we went inside and forgot about it for the night. In the following days, Sheila decided to extend her visit. It wasn't a bad thing, although I would have preferred that she left as always. Sometimes you're just not in the mood for company anymore. But Sheila cooked and spent that time with Lucy after school, and George and I worked, so I just let it go. It was better for Lucy to have someone at home. I was worried that she would ask to move in, but I didn't want to start anything. I got home from work one night and Sheila had something on the stove that smelled really good. But she saw me and shut the gas off, pulling me outside and saying, I have to talk to you. I asked what was going on this time and she said David had come around and been lurking. I asked her what she meant and she said the neighbor had gone through our mailbox, got on the porch and even tried to see through the window. Rover then started barking and he went away, and I asked her why she hadn't opened the door and questioned what he was doing. She looked at me like I had asked her to drop her panties off in the middle of the mall. I can't do that, she said. 
I was alone. Who knows what he was up to? I could only sigh and calm her down. We went back inside, George got home and we ate. That night I told my husband all about this David situation. He trusted his mother and got worried and we talked about getting cameras. But honestly, he and I would be considered experts in procrastination when it comes to things like that so we never actually got them. I wish we had. It would have saved a lot of trouble for us. Anyway, Sheila left a few weeks later and I promised myself to pay attention to David. One evening he was watering his plants as I got home. A few minutes later I heard George's car and looked through the window. David was at his mailbox. He waved at George who waved back and that was that. But I noticed something else. I asked George if he had misplaced our photo from our first beach vacation with Lucy. She was a baby in it. I'd framed it and kept it in our living room since we moved from our apartment, and he hadn't. I asked Lucy, who looked at me pretty quizzically like preteens do and shook her head, but it was gone. I combed through the house and found nothing. So I caved and called Sheila to ask if she had moved it. She jumped to accusations immediately. David must have gone inside your house. He took advantage of me being gone, she said. I really shouldn't have called her. I knew what would happen in the coming days, and Sheila booked a flight and told us that she would be staying here for a while. And I really hated that. She was just assuming our neighbor was behind it, and we had nothing against David to warn something like this, but George thought that it was a good idea so that Lucy didn't have to be alone when we might have a potential stalker or something. And I couldn't argue against that logic. And so... I had to live with my mother-in-law. No matter how much you love your in-laws, you don't really want to live with them permanently. Every day I had to come home to a full report on what David was doing. Sheila wanted to find out more about him because although David attended block parties and all that, he wasn't the most forthcoming, so we didn't know much about him except that he lived alone. Not everyone has to be a people person, but Sheila wouldn't let up. I asked around and most neighbors didn't know much either, except one, a woman in her late 60s who lived a few streets away. Now if you think this lady was a typical grandma, you'd be wrong. I'll call her Claudine. She didn't look a day older than 45 and was the life of the party everywhere she went. She drank like a fish but could hold her liquor and you would never see her drunk even after downing a whole bottle of wine. But after drinking, she got talkative and I approached her at a Halloween event. She was the only person there without children, which is why she had already helped herself to the wine, but I talked about myself and asked her about life. She was a big career woman and a world traveler. We had the former in common, I guess. After around two hours, I asked about David, trying to be kind of sneaky about it. She didn't notice anything wrong and dove right into what she knew. Apparently, David had lost his wife and daughter many years ago. He wasn't as old as her, but this had happened way before my daughter was born. Claudine said that since their death, David stayed a good neighbor and would help others in a second, but he wasn't the vibrant or talkative person others knew him to be. He was the life of the party once, she told me, and I nodded as she explained more, and then we were distracted by the party and other people. I went home and talked to my husband, telling him that I really didn't think David was doing anything wrong. We couldn't just suspect someone of stalking or worse when they were just a lonely old person. And George agreed with me. And for a reason, I asked him not to tell his mother anything. I just didn't want her to know what I had found out. Unfortunately, as I was pulling into the driveway after work the next day, I saw Sheila yelling at David. She stood at the edge of the front yard while David was on the edge of his. I got out of the car and heard her shouting, Never come near my son and his family again. What's going on? I asked her. And Sheila turned to me, her face red and the veins on her neck about to pop, and she says, I can't believe you didn't tell me about what you heard about him. Everything makes sense. He's trying to, he's trying to get a new family. Yours. What? I asked again, because it was just so ridiculous. But she insisted accusing David of lurking again. My neighbor had the most confused look in the world and I just pulled my mother-in-law into the house. 
I gave her a very stern talking to and said that I wouldn't tolerate such crazy behavior when we were doing so well in our new neighborhood. Sheila tried to protest and I just shut her down. I scolded my husband later for telling her what we discussed, but he said that his mother needed to know. I was too tired after a long day at work to keep fighting him on this and the weekend was coming. Lucy had to play at school on Saturday evening and other parents who lived nearby would attend. I warned him that if he and Sheila wanted to come, she needed to maintain her composure. Saturday arrived and I got there early just to check if the room mothers needed more help and I chatted with them. Sheila had behaved herself as far as I knew since I scolded her so I saved them both seats. They didn't come. My daughter didn't have a huge part but George wasn't the kind of dad who missed things though and Sheila was a good grandmother and I was honestly stumped in that moment. I didn't know what to tell Lucy when the play was over and neither of them were there to congratulate her. So I said goodbye to people after taking a bunch of pictures and we left. I apologized to my daughter on the drive and she shrugged. She did that a lot when she was reaching her teens but I knew she was disappointed at least. I was seething on the inside though. If this absence had anything to do with my mother-in-law's crazy obsession with this David guy, I was going to blow the roof off. I just didn't know that our entire lives would change when I got home. Mom, the front door is open, Lucy said as I parked. What? I looked and she was right, and that wasn't normal for us, so I told her to stay in the car for a few minutes. I stepped in my house slowly and it was chaos. My coffee table was upside down. My grandmother's old lamp was broken on the floor. Some of the pictures on my wall were lopsided and others were on the floor too. I went further in, calling for George and Sheila, and no one answered. I felt my hand trembling as I grabbed my phone and dialed my husband's number. They kept dialing as I walked deeper into my house and suddenly... I heard it. His ringtone. I busted open our bedroom door and saw a huge disaster, but George's phone was sitting on the nightstand on his side of the bed. I called Sheila and heard her ringtone coming from the guest room we had turned into her room. I dialed 911 after that. I didn't know if it was too early to call them, but my pristine house was a mess, and my husband and mother in law were gone. The police arrived and inspected things, and that's when I remembered Rover. He was gone too. I told them what I could while keeping my arms around Lucy who was crying into my stomach. Answering the cops' questions was tough, but one was particularly difficult. The officer said, Had your mother-in-law or husband fought with anyone lately? And that's the first time I really, really suspected David. After weeks of Sheila's comments, I thought that maybe I should have listened, so I told him that my mother-in-law was convinced the neighbor was a stalker. I had to tell them what I had heard from Claudine and what Sheila had theorized. But I emphasized that I wasn't too sure. I didn't want to get him in trouble for absolutely no reason. And speaking of neighbors, some had gathered, including some of the moms who had seen me at the play. But David wasn't around. One cop went to his door and returned quickly, saying no one was home. That really made things worse, because in my heart, I told myself I should have been more careful. The cops left, promising to start an investigation and asked me to call them if I found anything new. But I couldn't stay in my house, putting my daughter at risk, so we packed some things and just went to a hotel. Claudine called me the next morning and asked what happened, and as I mentioned, she lives a few blocks away, so she wouldn't have seen the flashing police lights. I told her, along with my suspicions, and surprisingly, she said David would never have anything to do with that, and she was sure of it. And I told her he wasn't home either, and she said, he slept at her house. No one knew that they were together. The age gap was hard for some people to digest, she said, and I was stunned. I never imagined it. But it made sense, and looking back, we were near Claudine's house when David was walking alongside us while we walked Rover and Sheila made some of her first accusations. But he turned back when he did, and that was some time ago. I asked Claudine, and she said their 
thing had only been going on for a few months, and so the timeline fit. So what could have possibly happened to my husband and my mother-in-law if David wasn't the issue? I didn't find out. Ever. At all. After a few days at the hotel, I returned home with Lucy, and David even talked to me, offering his help if the cops were searching or something, and I thanked him. The police talked to him, too, and I think they cleared him of any suspicions quickly. They did conduct searches with trained dogs and all of that stuff later. They searched Sheila's out-of-state house, and it was perfect, but no one had been around for a while. No CCTVs had captured anything, no security cameras. They had no clue. Nothing. Until they found a rescue dog dead on a farm two hours away, and his tag had my dog's name. They wouldn't have paid attention to that if my husband and mother-in-law's disappearance wasn't so strange. One of the original officers told me that I had to prepare myself and my daughter because it was a very likely thing that George and his mother were no longer alive. It wasn't easy, but I realized my strength then. I stayed strong for my kid, pushing us to go back to our somewhat regular lives while the police did their job. And time went on, and the strange normal became our very real normal. And the case went cold. No bodies, once again, nothing. And years passed on, and Lucy entered her teens. She was having a rough time in high school, so I just couldn't wait any longer. We had to leave. We moved hours away to a much sunnier area surrounded by beaches, and I watched Lucy thrive. Myself as well. As hard as it is to confess, getting away was the only right thing for us to do. And more years went by, and Lucy graduated high school and went to college. She's about to graduate from pre-law, and I'm very proud of her. So I was planning a pretty big trip abroad. And remember when I said before about the post on a random account that I don't follow? The one that changed our lives? You know how your phone now just knows things? Like you're thinking of buying a new bathing suit and suddenly you get ads for swimwear. I know there's some kind of computery explanation here, but that's not the point. This is about the picture that made me question everything. It's been a long time, but I'd know him anywhere. George stood in that background of that photo. And I know people have lookalikes, but Sheila was with him. Her face was clear as day, even if they were behind some model in a bathing suit. And I checked the account. It was a brand for swimwear, of course, and they had several models in different pieces, but on the same street. I tried to search from them in other photos, but there was nothing, meaning that they must have walked by while the brand was doing their photo session or something. And so my husband and mother-in-law, who had disappeared from our lives almost ten years ago, who were considered dead, were suddenly perfectly fine on the streets of some European country known for art and good food. Maybe I'm going crazy. Maybe it's just been too long. But what happened? Why did they leave? Was it planned? Did they kill my dog? I wish I knew and... I'm not sure I should tell Lucy or anyone for that matter. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday and Thursday at 7pm EST, and super fun live streams on Sundays and Wednesday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or submit it over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below.